Bags are located in the sides of front seats to protect the occupants from side impacts. Curtain side airbags are located in the side edge of roof linings to protect the occupant's head from side impacts. The airbag assembly consists of a nylon bag, squib, igniter, gas generator, and an airbag triggering mechanism. There are two different types of airbag trigger mechanisms, electrical and mechanical. Most airbags are triggered electrically, with a small electric current delivered from a remote SRS control unit. Mechanically activated systems use inertia to move a triggered pin. Regardless of the type of triggering mechanism, the airbag deploys due to simultaneous explosions occurring within the squib, the igniter, and the gas generator. All three of these are located in a metal housing attached to the back of the airbag assembly. The airbag is made from nylon and is folded into the front face of the assembly. It is coated in corn flour, which acts as a lubricant during deployment. When the control unit determines the airbag should be deployed, the electric current triggers the squib. The heat generated causes the igniter to burn, which in turn explodes the gas generator. High pressure nitrogen gas is produced and the airbag rapidly inflates. When the airbag assembly is mounted, it sits behind a pad which has a fracture line cast into the inner face. When the airbag deploys, the force of the generated gas causes the line to rupture, allowing the bag to fully inflate. Mechanically deployed airbags do not have any electrical circuitry. The squib is ignited with a firing pin. Under severe deceleration, inertia causes a steel ball to release a firing pin into the squib. Once the squib has been triggered, the deployment process is identical to electrically triggered airbags. The airbag is fully inflated within three hundredths or .03 of a second, cushioning the head and upper chest of the occupant as it moves forward. 35 miles per hour, look how bad it is. Damn. Holes are usually located in the rear face of the airbag to allow the nitrogen gas to escape. This deflates the airbag and provides a cushioned, rather than a hard surface, to help protect the occupant. There are a number of variations for steering boxes. There are either manual steering or power assisted steering. Manual steering has no power source to help make the wheel easier for the driver of the vehicle to turn, whereas power assisted steering uses hydraulic pump or electric motor that aids the driver in turning the wheel. Older vehicles are available with manual steering and power steering was an expensive option. This is not the case now as any vehicle purchase will come standard with a form of power steering. The function of all steering boxes is the same, whether manual or power, to transfer the rotary motion of the steering wheel in the side-to-side -side motion needed to make the wheels pivot left or right. There are two basic types of steering boxes, those with a rack and pinion gearing and those with worm gearing and sector shaft. In both cases, the gearing the steering box makes it easier for the driver to turn the steering wheel, hence the wheels. The variation of steering boxes include a rack and pinion gearbox, the worm gearbox consisting of a worm and sector, the worm and roller, and the worm and nut, which is commonly referred to as the recirculating ball. The rack and pinion gearbox has a pinion connected to the bottom of the steering column. The pinion runs in the mesh of the rack that is connected to the steering and tie rods. This connection gives more direct operation, which enables the, enables the driver to feel the road better. Both the pinion and the rack teeth are helical gears in an inclined plane is wrapped around a cylinder. The edge of the plane forms a shape called a helix. Rotation of the cylinder causes the point of the helix to move along the surface of the cylinder. The distance the point moves in one revolution of the cylinder is called the pitch. The helix shape is commonly used on thread nuts and bolts and also for teeth and steering gears and transmission. The particular shape and positioning of the teeth and the helical gearing enable smoother and quieter operation for the driver. 
Uh, and mechanical advantage is gained by reduction ratio, the ratio between the turns of the steering wheel and the angle turns of the wheel. The value of this ratio depends on the size of the pinion. A small pinion uh, gives easy steering, but it requires many turns of the steering wheel to travel from lock to lock, which as far as the steering wheel can be turned from one side to the other. Instead of the single hard turn of the steering wheel, the driver turns the wheel several times with less force with behind each turn. A large pinion means the number of turns of the steering wheel is reduced, but the steering is harder to turn. In the bracket pinion, steering system has the advantage of a large degree of feedback and direct steering feel, meaning the driver can feel the road well. A disadvantage of the bracket pinion steering system is that it typically is not manually adjustable. Over time, it does wear and develop lash between the pinion teeth and the rack teeth, which is felt as play or movement in the steering wheel that does not move the wheels. In many cases, replacement of rack and pinion is the only cure for excessive lash in the gear teeth. We also call that steering free play. In the rack and pinion steering system, the steering rack is supported at the pinion end by being sandwiched between pinion and spring-loaded rack guard yoke sometimes called the rack bearing. Spring-loaded rack guide yokes are made out of metal nylon and other durable material and have a spring that pushes on the backside of the rack to help reduce the play between the rack and the pinion while still allowing the relative movement. There will be an adjuster plug that screws into the body of the rack to put pressure on the rack guide yoke. The adjustment produces the correct mesh in the rack teeth to the pinion teeth. It also affects the amount of torque required to turn the pinion. The rack is typically supported at both ends of the rack using a tube by, uh, or a tube by, bushing, by a bushing. A nylon piece that keeps the rack from wearing on metal housing. The nylon is used because it has a low coefficient of friction and lower wear, uh, low wear rates. The bushings are an integral part of the steering system suspension system. The bushings enable the flexibility needed to accommodate slight radial lateral movement to assist the anti-binding or release when something gets stuck. However, when the bushings wear beyond its limits, they become a liability because they no longer are effective at eliminating play in the steering rack. Regular maintenance and inspection of the steering system is necessary to ensure the safety of the vehicle and its occupants. The pinion is supported by two bearings in the rack housing. The bearing must be preloaded uh, to ensure that the pinion is in correct position relative to the rack and to eliminate free play. A rack and pinion steering box is normally lubricated by grease. Each end of the rack is protected by dirt and water by a flexible synthetic rubber bellows attached to the rack housing and the tie rod. With the rack and pinion steering, a rack is directly connected to the tie rod assembly which is attached to the steering knuckle. The tie rod assembly consists of an inner and outer tie rod end that are threaded together. The inner tie rod is threaded into the rack and has a ball and socket swivel joint to allow movement in any direction. The other end of the inner tie rod is threaded to allow attachment to the, other, uh, to the outer tie rod end which provides the method used to adjust the toe angle. The steering arm, the stub axle buckle knuckle. The steering arm, the stub axle knuckle, and the stub axle carrier which is the body of the stub axle knuckle, can be forged as one piece and can be referred to a steering knuckle. They can also be made of separate units and assembled to form one piece. In the warm gear, steering box is made to process uh, turning of the front wheels, an easier task for drivers of the early automobile. The warm gear box uses two gears, a worm and worm gear, also called a worm wheel. The worm has teeth cut in helical or spiral shape and operates the same as a screw. In this case, the helix on the worm moves the worm wheel one tooth for each revolution of the worm. The helix provides smooth and quiet steering operation for the driver. It converts the rotary motion of the steering wheel to a linear motion needed to control the wheels. Worm gears have another benefit. They do not transmit nearly as much road shock as a rack and pinion gear assembly. When the worm is driven, uh, by the steering wheel, the output gear moves easily since each turn of wor worm advances the worm wheel one tooth. But the worm wheel is driven, such as on a road shock, the worm wheel teeth butt up against the teeth on the worm, 
preventing most of the force from being transmitted as a rotary motion to the worm. This occurs because most of the force from the output gear is nearly perpendicular to the rotation of the worm gear. There are three popular styles that include the worm and sector, worm and roller, and their recirculated ball gearboxes. A worm and sector gearbox uh, was the first worm gearbox was uh, the worm and sector style. This wor the worm is meshed with a sector piston portion of the gear mounted on its own shaft. It's called a sector shaft and right angles to the worm. The outer end of the sector shaft has a tapered or straight spline that mates with an internal spline in the pitman arm. As the steering wheel rotates, the worm causes the sector to move through an arc and transfer the motion to the pitman arm to the steering linkage. The worm shaft is wor uh, in a worm and roller steering box that has an hourglass shape and, is, and it meshes with a double track roller mounted to the, on bearings on a pin attached to the pitman shaft. This gearbox was improved into the worm and sector style and reduced the friction due to the roller, which reduces the friction between two gears. This design makes the turning the steering wheel a lot easier. Then you got this weird thing. It's called the recircling ball steering box. It contains a worm gear inside a block. With a threaded hole on it, the gear teeth cut into the outside and engage the sector shaft to move the pitman arm. Um, you see down here is with the pump, most uh, power steering pumps are called rotary type, or rotary vane type. Oh, another important thing when you guys are taking the gearbox out, this is a, a, these are splines that's connected to the steering column or, the, or intermediate shafts. So there's a, a bolt that goes across here. You guys got to make sure you take that out pull this out and also uh, when you're putting it back in these have what you call uh, master splines they're bigger than the other one so you guys got to make sure it goes in there correctly this was developed in 1940 and is an improved version of worm and sector and worm and nut types worm gear in the recycling ball gearbox both ends of the worm shaft are supported in the housing by angular bearings which are preloaded to 